welcome to episode eight of Let's Hear It. Today's guest is John Grayboff, and you saw him also in episode one, but I wanted to bring him back today because he has one of my favorite instruments, which is a Fender Telecaster that has been turned into what's called a B-Bender. So most guitar players will know what that is, but um, if you don't, the idea behind it, it was invented in the late 60s by Clarence White and Gene Parsons, who were both in the birds at that point. And Clarence had an idea that he wanted a guitar that could mimic the sound of a pedal steel, which that gives you a pedal steel has, and we will also do another episode with John about the pedal steel because that's an extremely complicated instrument. But there are pedals and levers that lift the pitch of a string and Clarence White wanted to be able to do that with his guitar on stage rather than playing a pedal steel. So Gene Parsons from The Birds was a machinist and he came up with an idea to build in a little pulley system in the guts of the guitar and it operates from the guitar strap that's attached to the guitar so by pulling your shoulder a little bit you can make the strap move and it'll pick up a it'll take the b string that's why it's called a b bender just the b string is the one that operates through this mechanism and it will lift it up as if you were bending the note uh that's a fairly uh i don't know if that's a great description but john will demonstrate and describe it probably much more eloquently than i will um but it's an amazing sound it really uh clarence white Define the sound of country rock electric guitar. He, we also spoke with him, about him a couple days ago when we talked to Tyler Grant about his flat picking playing, but Clarence was an amazing electric guitar player and particularly on this B-Bender. Uh, people are still using these. They're still made today, even by different people. Um, some of them even on acoustic guitars, uh, but people like Marty Stewart, Brad Paisley, uh, various other people, Mike Campbell, uh, from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Keith Richards as well. So let's bring on John Grayboff and talk about the Fender Telecaster slash B-Bender. Hello, John, from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hey, Gary, how you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you too. So tell us about this guitar, when you got it, what inspired you, and maybe you can show us how it works. Well, I've had this guitar longer than any guitar I own. I uh, bought it a really long time ago for $160, which seems really cheap, but it was a really long time ago. And when I bought it, it had no finish on it at all. Somebody had like crudely scraped off the finish, and one of the pickups didn't work, but 160 bucks is about all I had at the time. So I bought this. It's a, this is the ultimate Frankenstein guitar. It, it's a 1967 body. It originally had a rosewood, rosewood fingerboard, but a friend of mine had a 67 with a, with a maple neck and we swapped necks because I wanted a maple neck and he wanted the rosewood. So it's a 60, no he actually had, this was a 66 neck on a 67 body and basically the only original parts of the guitar that I bought was, is the pick guard, the body, this plate, this plate and the two knobs and everything else has been changed a million times over the, over the years. I think I even sent you a picture of a compilation of all the different finishes I've had on this guitar at one point or another. I guess I couldn't quite make up my mind. The last finish that, that you're looking at now I did on my kitchen table in New York City a couple years ago. <laughs> um, nothing fancy about it, just kind of hand rubbed, hand stained. Um, However, I was a Clarence White devotee. I just thought he was the most interesting guitarist I would ever heard at that time. I remember, and as a matter of fact, I think Marty Stewart has, has also mentioned that his guitar fills after the pedal steel solo in 100 years from now on the Birds album, Sweetheart of the Rodeo, was the thing that completely captivated him about Clarence White, and it had the exact same effect on me. I remember, it's all, I think it's all the way panned over to the right and I would just turn off the left speaker and just stick my head by the speaker and just listen to this guy play because it was captivating. So I wanted a B-Bender in, in the worst way. I was flat broke when Gene Parsons first made them commercially available. He was doing it himself at his, uh, at his place in Casper, California. 
and at the time it was four hundred dollars and I didn't have four hundred dollars but as soon as I did have four hundred dollars I packed up my guitar and I sent it to him and he put it in for me for four hundred dollars and I've had it ever since and I love this guitar it's not a, it's actually not a great guitar I've tried a million different pickups in it this is the word to the wise it's all about the wood if if the guitar sounds good when you just pick it up and play it without plugging it in, it doesn't, almost doesn't matter what pickups are in it. Because um, I've tried them all and it doesn't make any difference. So it's not a great, great Telecaster, but it's the one that I will never sell because I love it. And Gene put this thing in himself in 1977. Yeah, awesome. Um, and my description of how it works was probably not the best. So why don't you, maybe you can show us exactly how it works and then play us a little example. Okay, well, the first, the, the, whole, the whole concept of the thing is that there's a, me a mechanism that connects to the shoulder strap. And you can see the shoulder strap button move up and down. That's attached to a linkage that, that then goes to this little wheel behind the bridge down here where the B string, instead of going over the bridge and through the body like t Telecasters are normally strung, the string rides over the bridge uh, saddle and wraps around this little knob and when you pull down on the shoulder strap it rotates this little wheel and it raises the pitch of the string and it's tuned with this little knob up on top which basically all it does is restrict the throw of the mechanism. So as I pull out it hits this tuning thing, and that's how you can fine-tune the, um, uh, the mechanism. Uh, the mechanism has changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, Gene had uh, modified it and kind of more refined it in a way, made it a little bit more pro-looking, because this thing is pretty... Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he did a nice job, but it's not exactly what I would call fine cabinetry work. Um, but it works, it works great and it sounds like this. If I just turn up this guitar and I do without fretting it and I just... So in its purest form, that's, that's sort of what it does. Ah. And when most people get these things, all they do, all they tend to do on these things is... But there's a whole lot more you can do with it that are, that's infinitely more interesting. Um, so, for example, if I was if in and I, you know, one one lick I was always particularly fond of is if I was in the key of G. that major third. So that's basically how it works. Amazing. Uh, so I know you you talked about a uh, hundred years from now, but let's let's hear you play. So I think you said you're gonna play Tulsa County, which is one of my favorite bird songs. Yeah from, it's a great uh, song. The solo the solo in it is really great. Um, and it kind of demonstrates a lot of the things that made Clarence's technique particularly interesting because there was a whole lot more about his timing and his phrasing that was, uh, that goes, you know, the B-Bender in my, my estimation in his playing was only about 30% of what made his playing so special. But he used that 30% really interestingly. But it was really, really for me, it was really all about the syncopated style that he had and, uh, and his phrasing. And I'll, show, I'll give you an example. This is the solo in the song Tulsa County Blue from the um, uh, Easy, uh, Ballad of Easy Rider album. And it kind of goes like this. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, what an amazing sound that is. And I remember listening to it when I was younger and I didn't know what a B-Bender was. So I assumed it was either some weird pedal steel guitar or uh, just somebody who could play with incredible bending skill. Uh, so it's... Well, you know, the thing about it, it was before he did the B-Bender thing, he used to do this. Do the bend behind the nut thing. Now, if you listen to the bird song, um, Time Between, on the Younger Than Yesterday record, that's the first recording of Clarence with the birds. And that was pre-B-Bender. And um, so the solo in that... As you can see, it's really about it's more really, really more about his syncopated style and phrasing necessarily than the B bender because the only B bender thing that would have been replaced if he had a B bender at the time is that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, he yeah. Yeah. It's fun. Was, it's fun to think of those two guys uh, trying to figure out how can we how can we figure out how to do this so I don't have to do that technique. Uh, and I can seamlessly play it. So I, 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 I know there's a great video of Gene Parsons explaining it. Yeah, and, if, and there's a bunch of photographs online of the internal guts of uh, his main guitar, the one that Marty Stewart owns now. And you can see there was a lot of experimentation going on there. This thing is kind of amazing. Uh, they also, he also used uh, pedal steel, um, Fender pedal steel mechanism parts on Clarence's guitar, he's got this whole panel in the back, and they actually, they actually originally made it so he could try to experiment with bending different strings. They ended up just going with the B string, found that the most versatile and useful out of all their experimentation. But go online and find those pictures because they're pretty, they're pretty amazing to look at. Uh, it's it's pretty crude. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, um, and as a pedal steel player yourself, how do you, do you, does that instruct your B bending style at all? Or is there a, a crossover between those two instruments? There's a very, there's very little, there's a little crossover. And basically the crossover is that. But I mean, that's, that's, that's B bender day one and that's pedal steel day one, if you know what I mean. That's yeah. the first thing you do on both of those things. But there's a lot, that's what, and then in my, my idea, my thinking, that's where they sort of diverge. Um, you can do that on both instruments, but when you start getting more interest into what they can do uniquely, they really part company. And so I think there's, there's a little bit of overlap, but in my mind, there's very little overlap. If you want a pedal steel, get a pedal steel. If you want a B-Bender thing, get a B-Bender thing. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, you want to play us another little example, and then we'll let you go back to your day. Well, here's 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 when I first got this thing, there was a little 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 tune that I that I came up with, trying to utilize um, some of these techniques, and it was like. Um, It, but this this is the kind of thing you can you can't do on a regular guitar. Because you're you're holding these these notes and bending in the middle of it. It's, it's really interesting to hear it and think about what a influence that sound has had on country music, Americana music, singer songwriter music. That sound is used in so many different uh, recordings. So great to see how it works. Yeah, I mean, like the, the intro to Tulsa County Blue. We're pulling up to unison. Getting a 
little half step moves. The one, the other mistake that people get uh, um, make when they first get these things, and they think it's all really about pulling down on the neck, which it's not really. It's because if you see, if you if your hand is occupied pulling the neck down, it's really limiting your 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 dexterity. It's really more about it's a combination of pulling down on the guitar with your arm and a little bit with the hand. Because I'm, I'm really kind of pushing down here. Now the one thing I have to admit is that when I, went, I saw the birds with Clarence five times and I would go down to the front of the stage, edge, edge of the stage and stand like right in front of him and watch everything he did. And I think he got to the point where he started to recognize me and think I was some really weird, weird ass kid stalking him or something. But I noticed that he just didn't do a whole lot of flailing around. It was much more of a gentle. So, for those, those who get their hands on them, keep that in mind. Don't, don't use your hand so much to pull the thing down. Use your shoulder and your hand. Ah, whatever. So, there you go. I think that pretty much kind of sums up this guitar. Well, thank you, John Grayboff. Uh, we'll have you back soon so you can explain the mystery of the pedal steel guitar. All right, well, I'll dedicate a, a little bit more time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be a 50-minute or over an hour long episode. Oh, I hope not, because you, you hear a lot of snoring going on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you for joining us today, John. All right. Good to see you, Gary. Talk to you soon. Good to see you, too. Bye. Well, there you go, the mysteries of the B-Bender. Hopefully... Uh, gives you a little knowledge about how those work. And uh, we will post a video of Gene Parsons, who is really the co-inventor and the mastermind behind the machinery of the B-Bender. We'll post a video about him talking about how he did that. And if you are a fan of country music, if, if you like Marty Stewart, uh, the Marty Stewart show was a TV show that Marty Stewart did that I think ran in 2014 and 15. You probably can find some episodes of those, but. He plays just absolutely ripping B-Bender guitar. Awesome. Anyway, check back in a couple days for the next episode of Let's Hear It. Thanks again for watching.